And welcome back, everybody, to the Refresh Point. My name's Ben, and as always, I'm joined by Steve. How's it going? Having a pretty good week. Uh, you know, just uh, on the grind, practicing all the time. We're uh, trying to capture that Weiss glory. Yeah, dying to slime. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of dying to slime, uh, everybody died to this slime player uh, recently at the Rosemont Regional. Uh, welcome to the show, Clinton. How's it going? Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, how you doing, man? How's it been? You know, I've been doing the exact opposite of Steve, where I've barely played any games. <laughs> <laughs> how, how great does it feel to be just a winner you know <laughs> just, you know i'm you fumbling to... around with uh, data live cards oh yeah yeah data live nice <laughs> so for those of you uh, who man. may not be super familiar uh clinton clinton could you talk about uh your competitive career how long you've been playing weiss some of your background yeah, I started playing, you know, only in English when uh, Madoka first came out. So, which at this point seems like forever ago. Yeah. And, and I think I'm pretty much the only person to have won at every level that this game had, even, at, you know, a prior level, which they completely removed in the Continentals. Yeah, yeah. I was at the 2015 Continentals. So, <laughs> that's the last time I won anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we're going to have Clinton here on the whole podcast today, going over breaking news, spy corner, all sorts of new stuff, and finally, uh, a whale sighting within our own midst once again, and at our guest. Uh, so, don't forget to shuffle your decks, tap or cut, and we'll get right into the refresh point with some breaking news. Uh... Thankfully, Bushiro made a good decision for once with the Costa Rica winner. Uh, did you hear about that? Uh, you know, I definitely did, but go ahead and refresh the audience's Sure, uh, memory sure. For so, that. Uh, it turns out not all of the Y sets are legal everywhere in the world. Uh, and they're also not legal to be played everywhere in the world. One of these being uh, the Costa Rica regional, where I think one of the quint sets and also the entirety of uh, Nazarick is illegal for play. Uh, and if you recall, the winner of the Costa Rica regional was a Nazarick player. Yeah, turns uh, out cheating is the actual best strategy in Weiss. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> He would allowed cheating. <laughs> allowed cheating. He did. I I believe he mentioned that he taught asked a That's judge. That's correct. He asked I think six judges, or uh, he he asked the judge that he found, and also the head judge, and all judges told him, "Yeah, bro, it's legal." If that isn't a uh, ringing endorsement for the Bushiro judge uh, questionnaire. Then I, I don't know what is. <laughs> come, on, come on, man. <laughs> but he did get to keep his world's invite, keep the prize egg, I believe. That's know. honestly the least they could do. Yeah, like, yo, know, like. Yeah. I know we screwed you over, but. But maybe we'll just this one time. <laughs> I hate how vague they worded that statement. Oh, yeah, true, it just true. said he got to keep his world invites. Oh. If I still haven't seen his for sales post with the winner's card, I would not have known he got to keep, you know, <laughs> at least the winner cards. I'm like, uh, him keeping his invite, does that mean he keeps his sponsored invite or he just gets a regular right, invite? Right, you know, yeah. I can assume he got all of the above. Ah, but you said you saw his, uh, his sale post. He's got the Benny Maru. Yeah, it's the Benny yeah. Maru's. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, that's nice. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's honestly that's the that's the good ending we can get behind. Everybody looks good, and uh, you know the the winner gets to go to Japan. So congrats to him. Mm -hmm. um, so if a twenty three man tournament gets three worlds invites, uh, that's like <laughs> well, that's like it's like eight eight percent of the whole event gets to go to worlds. <laughs> I also thought it would have been really cool if they would have offered that 
second place Dow player a sponsored invite also since I think that was one of the actual decks yeah that, that was actually, actually the criteria yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah, the deck yeah, that yeah, actually true. was legal and yeah, did the yeah, best yeah absolutely so yeah um, <laughs> it's it's the second best outcome best outcome uh, could, yeah yeah uh, Azure Lane is releasing at the end of the month uh probably like a week after this podcast is uh edited and released um yeah um, it uh it has soul rush and like a bunch of other things i think the most definitive characteristic of the set is how decent most of it is um yeah. where there will be a, a variety of strategies and it seems like a lot of their finishers are really reasonable like can can do a lot of work in the end game and they kind of work together a little bit um i don't know that it has the juice that it needs to crack into this current meta because the meta at the top especially is so hard you know um you need very high power requirements you need very good uh utility uh powerful deck speed like you kind of need the whole package to crack that top four you know, if we're saying our top four is SAO, Slime, Overlord, and Hall Live various. Right, uh, sure. It, it's tough to crack into that without having some really sick mechanics. So uh, I'll we'll admit that I did not really look still that much at Azure Lane. We'll probably go over it more once it actually actually releases. But uh, yeah, did you uh, have you messed around with the boat hose at all, Clinton? I've played against a lot of people at uh, my locals who has it, but I don't own any of the cards myself or, you know, or played it. But the two things definitively I know about this set is A, there's a lot of cats. <laughs> the cats. And B, <laughs> like experience eight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do uh, seem to recall uh, one of their finishers being the like, experience yeah, an eight. obscene yeah. experience oh, requirement. Goodness. Yeah. What is it? Why do you? What does it do? On experience eight, do you remember Clinton? I have no. Hey, idea. You know what? That's fair. I, it was just like uh, that's I valid. Just stopped reading the card. Yeah, you're there. like, well, <laughs> that's never gonna happen. So no worries. There. <laughs> uh, we'll have a much uh, uh, more detailed breakdown of the set after it releases, uh, where we'll talk about our thoughts on builds. Um, I have some initial opinions, but uh, I've only seen a few limited ways that it's put together and a lot of it seems very gambly so uh not 100 percent sure on that uh there's already a lot of risky strategy decks in the format um that seem like they're doing a their payoff is a little bit better mm -hmm. but i will say that uh if you just take all of the damage from a soul rush deck that gets to bounce its entire field back to its hand you will lose <laughs> you will lose the whole game uh, that tends to hurt yes uh uh what is it uh, dying tends to make you dead. Yes. Yeah. People die when they're killed. This is true. Uh, and now, uh, on to the comment box. We got some more comments. We keep getting more of them, so keep it up. And we can keep farming them for this free content segment. It's great. It's great. It's great. Um, uh, first off, round of applause for Steve. Uh, he figured out how to say Eins every once in a while. He'll still say Ains every once in a while, but I he, he's he's saying more Ains. Listen, it's, it's listen, happening more if, often. If you took yeah, if you did a if you did a metric of all the times I've said Ains <laughs> over the course of the last like five episodes where we've had to talk about Ains either directly or tangentially, um, I, I definitely am. I'm at that seventy five percent number. I think now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, going. Uh, so thanks, SSB. Uh, or sorry, sorry. Uh, Vegeta. Uh, 93021 for thanking Steve <laughs> and uh, thanks again to Kix Machina TCG from the Philippines for again following up uh, really on your comment from last time uh, we we were asking about kind of some of the makeup of the Philippines regional and they came back they're like there's about 12 Sal players the majority were Alice, and the Kirisuna player was uh, Mark from Australia, who is probably the best Australian Weiss player. 
that's a heck of a claim considering uh, that region tends to bring it uh, when it comes to Weiss. Though a lot of their great players are, I think, more on the JP side of things. Yeah. I don't know anybody from Australia, so I can't really comment on that. Do you I, know this guy, Clinton? <laughs> I, I don't know him personally. Mm -hmm. I know a few lads from uh, Australia, from the worlds I've been to. No, my personal favorite is Matt Walters. Uh huh. Yeah, Matt Walters. He's, that's see, you can tell Clinton and I are, are <laughs> have been playing this game for too long because uh, we we always reach back for the for the legends. <laughs> the funny part is like this past year where they had like you have to submit a picture for the world's participant page. Yeah. You know, so of course mine is terrible and his is professional <laughs> tech and character select screen. <laughs> you just didn't you just didn't uh, wail out for the for the glamour shot for worlds. It's understandable. You know, it's a rough one. Hey, you can do it this year. Uh no, I already submitted a really terrible <laughs> crop picture already just for placeholder. <laughs> Well, if you change it's your like, mind, I did it so I won't get fined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm here so I don't get fined. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Jason, the Overlord player, uh, managed to find the podcast and leave their comment. Um, so they they do disagree about the reach. Uh, I think reading out the comment here, uh, I think what you guys said about Overlord definitely has some merit. Although I do slightly disagree with the point about the reach of. I think the reach is pretty solid because it's so reactionary. The fact that you can choose to burn your resources when you see your opponent within lethal range, I think is part of the appeal since it means you will more reasonably be able to hold resources for things like defensive counters or playing for follow-up turns. You don't just burn out and say, dang, I guess trying to kill you was wrong. Uh, I definitely think Slime is in some ways one of the harder matchups, uh, but there's very solid counterplay because Slime doesn't really do well much early, um, and you could very reasonably play for the double Eins, double one one line, which basically blows out Slime instantly if they don't find exactly double Shuna, double Murin on their level two turn. Uh, I would also argue that Overlord being a deck so good at tri-field slamming can put your early turns really behind and make it harder to decide between cards like Murin and Anti-Change Counter and could force Slime to uh, at minimum spend its resources to maintain the ability to threaten the board since Slime doesn't compress very well until second or third deck or the third deck arguably unless it gets to loop its level 2 combo for a few turns. Uh, so Clint, what are your thoughts on the Overlord Slime matchup? Uh, it's my general opinion that it's Slime favored. Yeah, so I think it is Slime favored because you're pushing a lot more damage out against them. And if they, and you know, an Overlord's major weakness is if certain levels of just taking too much damage just throws the whole, you know, the whole game plan out of whack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh... I, I appreciate this comment, and I, I will say, I haven't played the deck significantly. I've played it some. Um, but what I've noticed is um, any game where you are able to line up double Eins, double one one, that feels like you're just whirlwind slamming your opponent with resources. And I, I don't find that to be a line that is typical or, or even possible many times. Because... Uh, a lot of your pluses require uh, stock early, so like the double bounce back, things like this. Um, and the other thing is, uh, you don't have good setup engines. You have shell tier, uh, but you don't really have any way to like really tighten up the setup. You've got some like very small selective searches, but your brainstorm is check three, add one and you outside of you know salvaging from shout uh i think the deck is kind of weak on selectivity so i mean have to having to have both zeros both ones both threes and a bar like that's a that's a full grip basically a full grip setup um which i mean yeah if you get it it's it's fantastic but I so I, I will say at the very least uh he is running the salvage brainstormer sure but only one of it right uh and also four of the shell tier that clocks the vampire brides yeah yeah mm -hmm. so that's that's their other way to generate like like raw advantage is by clocking themselves over and over again mm. um but oh no uh wait uh oh okay 
No, so, he's running. Yeah. No, no, no. He's ready the search brainstormer. I mistook it for a different card. So yeah. he's running three of a tap two search brainstorm yeah. for mill five. Yeah. Uh, and also, he's if running you have, the search and salvage brainstorms. Yeah, and if you have a shout here, it lets you scry to waiting room. Uh, sure. At the yeah. end of climate it's, phase. It's a fine card. It gives sure. you some more speed. But I think overall, the selectivity of the deck is is slightly weak. Um, and so setting up double double early play, especially a lot of builds I'm noticing are only running two of the one one, mm. um, to try and like max out on other other stuff. So I I mean yeah, if you get it, I, I think that should be your your attempt at the like your strategy going into the game. But I, I don't know how often you're able to to really push that strategy through, especially in the face of like the raw consistency of what slime's gonna put down to the board like. There's no question they're they're gonna get their two one setup like ninety nine percent of the time. There's too I... many ways to <laughs> there's too many ways to configure it. I feel like you you just have like a terror like a nightmare in the back of your mind and like slime like setups happen on you in your sleep. But I I, I don't think it's yo know, you you are exaggerating a bit. But I really don't think it's consistent to the point that 90% of my games I have triple mirror on like not even yeah but Shuna, what right? I, that's not really what I meant not like sure, triple. Sure, sure. what I meant is like a hex proof several murins and like a board that's like very awkward to handle sure so even if it's not triple though uh Clinton how many triple muron turns did you fail to have during Chicago <laughs> I like none. That was the easy part. <laughs> okay. You know, it's always uh, assembling the Shizus at one. That was the trickiest part. Shizus at one is the trickiest so part. So the yeah. guy that won uh -huh. Chicago just uh -huh. said it was very easy to get triple Murin. Yeah. So I'm just going to. You know, I'm sometimes. I'm going to let that be what that is. Look, I'm just saying that, like. <laughs> You know, it you, feels you like die it happens, when you're killed, and yeah. like it a does lot of the feel times, like it happens to me a lot, and uh -huh. I'm glad to hear the just that that explanation <laughs> that it uh, does in fact happen all the time. It does happen a lot. Yeah, I just don't think it's literally ninety percent, but maybe you know I'm just trolling too hard, and that's the life. Yeah, I, getting the mirrors are easy. Sometimes getting the Shuna, that's the tricky part. Uh, I guess I always grab Shuna before Muron. I don't know what you do in general, but it's, I don't know. Uh. Well, I think oh, I guess to be fair, I'm only running two of like the the tutor, the human Muron. So I think Clinton, you run three, right? Of like the blue one. Oh, no, I also no, run you two. also run two. Then yeah, skill issue. Yeah, <laughs> can't compete. <laughs> too bad at the game. You know, it sucks to suck. But I do want to mention the whole uh, back to the Overlord yeah. deck. Yeah. That you know, it's it's a deck that when dinks are going right, it's a really good deck. And sometimes when you have to, you know, win a long tournament where you have to run hot, you know, that's one of the better decks if you're just running hot all day with. And then after playing against the end game combo, you know, playing against it more often, get to that point. It's kind of reminds me of an Escanor deck. Right. Yeah. Where it's pretty good. You know, if you're, you know, if you get to, you know, fight your opponent when they're at three zero. Yeah. Like you're going to get it most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You basically need one reel and then it's over. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I guess that's the thing is that you kind of need to run hot with it. And uh, I feel like slime, it, you could run a little less hot and, and kind of get away with it. I don't know what you think, Clinton, but. Yeah, like, you know, you could just win games just from, you know, even though you're not getting every done done right or everything is going right, you got enough of, you know, part of the plan that you, actually end up getting there yeah yeah but much. uh regardless uh i think it's it's a it's it's a any of those top four decks playing against each other they there's good opportunities but um i think that what i don't like specifically about this matchup for overlord is um they don't get the board wipe which makes their damage kind of suspect uh prior to hitting level three they have to respect you a lot and um that usually means lots of siding and siding against a level two is usually not going to produce any damage for you or very little damage for you i think that's the main crux of why this matchup is is slime favored but prince uh prince ws thank you so much for your uh comments and for your explanation um we we love to see this kind of engagement from our audience uh we definitely don't <laughs> claim to be experts on on everything but um 
we are seeing a lot of these matchups like play out. I did out cut frequently. a little bit of that comment off near the end just so we could get to talking about it. If you want to read the comment in full, it's on our New York episode. Uh, the last one, you know. Hey, but thanks to Jason, he helped me shift my view of Overlord to a deck where, <laughs> man, I really don't want to play this or it's not that great. So you know what? It gets people more often than I thought gave credit for. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I think that... So it's, you know, solid. I could see why it's a <laughs> top three deck. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's it's very much uh, about the pilot uh, with a deck like that because it does have some very technical play that um, you can easily uh, struggle with. Yeah. And with that, We've cleared out the mail. Oh, uh, one last shout out to Sati. Thanks for continuing to comment that you like our stuff. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, what is it? And now, finally, it's time for the Spike Corner. We're always back in the Spike Corner, spiking it up. Competitive play. That's the... Really, we've been talking about it all episode. It's always a Spike Corner, you know, in the soul. But, uh, first off... Uh, Clinton, I guess, if you don't mind, would you mind recapping your Chicago tournament a bit? Yeah, so Chicago, I started off strategically with a round one bye. Nice, nice. Yep. So I didn't have to do anything, just mentally prep myself. Then round two, I played against Steven. Nice, nice. Yep, yep. Yeah. Where we were having a solid, you know, we were having, you know, our usual scuff matchup where <laughs> it never goes according to plan for either player. So now I'm curious. I, I've heard, we've heard Steve's side of this. How was it scuff for you, if you remember? Like, I think I had like a terrible opening handful of climaxes. Right, right. And yet I just kept playing them. I found, you know, right before he and it got to the point where i just kept playing this cl climaxes over and over again and i just found huge pockets of damage going into that refresh and then it was over from there basically <laughs> yeah i think deck one was pretty ugly both ways like i saw he was out a lot and we were we were landing and then um the end of my deck two was like two climaxes on bottom and so it was like trigger you know, climax on bottom, refresh like five, penalty one, and then like I just eat like an entire, you know, buffet worth of uh, <laughs> damage and then the yeah, game yeah. ends. Uh, Clinton and, so and I have uh, played competitively several times. Uh, I think we met uh, at Origins and this was in 2015 probably. Um, so that was... I mean, it feels like forever ago, but yeah, uh, we it was either Origins or that funky Gen Con side event. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was the, one of the two. My, the one that the store owner, you know, managers of a local I had, he organized. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but we go way back and uh, I feel like my most iconic, my my most memory wise victory was over Clinton's team at, at Spring Fest. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I just can't, we just can't, I can't capture Houston. It's just too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm 0 for 3 in finals in 3v3 <laughs> in Houston. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, dang. It's, uh, That's rough. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that, uh, it's that home field advantage, you know. That's what pushes you. Yeah, See, you, so, you, know, you so win you Rose believe mine, in it, it yeah. works. Yeah. <laughs> You can win Rosemont, and then I guess somebody else has to win Texas. I don't think a Texas team has won Houston in the last two or three years. Yeah, it's yeah. been a, it's been a rough one considering how much talent is in Texas. We continually team kill each other yeah. to our detriment. <laughs> I feel like so. Like although it's not my best performance or the best finishing performance, but but it's memorable to me was when Riaz and i and connor got third place and i just let connor play whatever bs he wanted to play which ended up being fubuki roboco waifu <laughs> yeah i remember that too <laughs> nice nice all right and so that was round two yeah and what happened to rounds three through eight yeah, so they're getting kind of hazy, so I'm going to start lumping them together. That's fine. But the third yeah. <laughs> match was funny. It was my first and only slime mirror match what? in two whole regions. You only got one! <sighs> and as soon as I mulligan, my opponent is like, oh man, is that max rarity? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh damn, I'm behind. Because he has my rarity. 
so of course I was blessed and he was always behind on the combo <laughs> so I was able to get off so my so my transition went from triple Shizu combo into a triple Shizu combo into triple Mirren ah wow man that's tough uh yeah kids max rarity is definitely a competitive buff that you could go for it's not fake at all <laughs> so and then yeah. round four i played it against my first gura deck of the day uh -huh. and it was against gordon from you know the georgia area who's really fantastic player i played him like twice last year in high leverage games so it was you know it was getting really close to towards the end like my turn when i was trying to kill him i couldn't kill him but i expended the rest of my stock to clock kick uh a girl and he didn't have enough cards in hand to double girl me, and i was able to cancel and just kill him on the swing back yeah well it's it's definitely important you know do you get that feeling when you're when you're playing in a regional and things start to kind of fall into place like you know you feel like it might be your day yeah like i always told riaz where i'm like man to win a big tournament you have to catch at least two big breaks and i knew that was one of them right <laughs> yeah. off the bat <laughs> yeah yeah i i've definitely said it on the podcast before but uh making top eights is a, is a matter of skill but but winning tournaments that you need you need a little luck to get to get to the yeah. to get to the finals for sure. Anything memorable about five through eight, or is that all lumping in? Like five through eight, I think I, I played a, a Nino deck the you know the round afterwards wow. in which Nino in round six. How the mighty has fallen, where I just completely <laughs> just had a way bigger board and just ran out of board and hand to do anything. Yeah, over the course of the game, it's wild how like 12k at at level two is not getting it done anywhere in the meta like just not it's 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 crazy yeah uh it's funny actually it's kind of funny to me that uh and nino made it to round six uh like undefeated anyways yeah i think yeah, i think go ahead. i think that was round five oh, that and was then five. round okay. six i played against roshan and oh, his yeah. uh sao uh, argo deck mm. Mm. a choice yeah, so that game was looking kind of good but for him. But then I noticed during his refresh that he was only refreshing back. So I'm like, oh man, his hand is literally two Argo Climaxes and the Alice <laughs> Climax. So then, of course, you know, I just landed a bunch of extra damage in a course of two turns to just be too far ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, you know, another feature of that deck is of, of eight pans in general is that. If your opponent starts to wobble a little bit, you'll usually always have the the punish for the time. You know that there's a there's a timing to that sort of thing where a lot of times, if your opponent doesn't have the climax at the right time, you can you can skirt out the back door with with a with a shaky deck as long as you get another turn to right the ship. But you know if you're the you know the biggest driver of bar and pants as as value climaxes is the ability to like see and recognize those states and just drop the heaviest possible punish and so seven eight how do we get our winning in <laughs> so seven so seven was funny we're down to the final three undefeated and I was trying to ask the judge, hey, if I quote unquote lose this round, can we cut this round? And they told me flat out no. So like, oh, I got to play, damn it. And I'm playing against a local of mine. And then I'm like, oh, this sucks. Like, it's going to be a damn if you do, damn if you don't with tiebreakers here. Yeah. So he was playing uh, uh, Gura, Right. And then he had the typical Gura game where it just completely fell apart in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Or you're just trying to scrape by to get to girl and maybe try to get a window to finish, which wasn't even close. <laughs> yeah. That will do. Then uh, last round of Swiss, I played against the undefeated uh, Ichika deck. All right. How do you feel about that so, matchup uh, playing Slime? So... I played two games against that deck and each time we're, we're either both do nothing, you know, so the first time in Swiss where we were basically both not really doing anything 
like where he just kept mad triggering climax and drawing them and i wasn't drawing any climaxes and then eventually i'm like all right if i survived the level three with his ichika combo i could kill him back but then he was able to get me with that yeah and I've... then in the finals was the reverse where a same thing well for me where i actually canceled and same thing he was triggering and drawing a lot of choice climaxes and so it turned into a non-game yeah that's unfortunate you uh we hate to see that but i do note that uh that finisher is particularly potent against slime which has a tendency to cancel so uh the the actually the better you are at weiss the the better that finisher works against you but hear me out if we just have eight climaxes in a deck of like 20 cards <laughs> it just all blocks <laughs> Like, you could, you know, position yourself to be, you know, in better shape against that combo. Mm -hmm. You know, force a refresh before going into their turn right, yeah. at the end. But, and also, I guess if... Because when they have a full board, they get to shuffle back four. If there's four in your waiting room to shuffle back and it's going to burn four. So you got an, you know, you don't have a not unreasonable number to cancel. Yeah. Uh... I think against uh, Silica and against Ichika, like yeah, keeping an eye on when the refresh is going to happen is a is a very important like idea for the person playing against it. Yeah, um, yeah. You you were there last night, Steve, uh, at our locals where I was I was playing against an Ichika deck and I was like, all right, we're at three zero, uh, but we have two cards left in deck that are clean, so there's no way that it can uh it can come back to bite me in this deck state we shuffle back seven climaxes cancel on three after the refresh cancel on one uh cancel on three shuffle back two cancel on one and then a vanilla swing for cancel on one <laughs> impressive yeah <laughs> sometimes it just doesn't yeah it just, sometimes it just doesn't matter you're shuffling back but it doesn't matter i was literally sitting there like huh neat <laughs> crazy yeah that's how it is sometimes uh and so how was top cut for you what was the path uh, so it's the top eight i, pl I believe i played against a player fr that traveled from dallas and he was also playing as hi bill yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we had a close competitive game where towards the end where i have to survive his uh attempt with like double gura thanks to hitting two climaxes off a of brainstorm and then triggering a gura climax on first attack it was the first time I ever seen somebody hit the problem where they had too many hand cards in hand for Gura to activate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's that's one of those conditions that never comes up till it does. Yeah. Yeah. How did you feel drawing through like the next few cards and realizing you lived anyway? Oh, I felt pretty good. At least you know it made at the very least it made my opponent you know feel less crappy because i also hurting for him because i thought that was a non-existent condition too <laughs> yeah i think the judge came in and pointed it out yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. was the judge yeah it was the good old judge for the first time ever being really proactive in something <laughs> man we're not gonna get a lot of likes from the bushy road judges at this one <laughs> Hey, but shout out to the judges. They have, you know, they have a long and hard day True. doing this, True. especially making it to top cut. And most of the time they do a very good job. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so after our, after our boy gets felled, what was, I, I actually don't remember what was your semifinals match. I played against my friend and local and 3v3 partner in Chicago, Vince, and he's playing seven deadly sins. Oof. Yeah, he was playing the uh, Max Rarity uh, Escanor. <laughs> Escanor. Max dude. Rarity Escanor. Yeah. Broken, dude. Broken. You need like two foils. It's great. <laughs> it has so, you know, so I know. Our I know. first decks, he was crushing me in it. But then, you know, during our second decks, completely turned it around where I canceled and he took the damage and that basically just lost it for him right then and there just from the second death deck shuffle. Ouch. yeah so the the biggest thing they lost in the restrict was you know they're like getting that super reach you know the 
where they can kind of win out of nowhere. What were? Do you remember what your damage was when he was trying to trying to drop threes? Yeah, the first time he dropped the threes, I think I was at like two two. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's and not and not being able to bounce. Uh, I mean, you're just not gonna. Yeah, yeah. you're not gonna get there. That's not happening. Uh, yeah. Damn. Yeah, and then he also knows that I, you know I played the memory kick counter with the Shuna out that it was gonna be pretty rough after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you. Have, it's like what choice do you have? You know, you uh, you can't front, but you also can't really side, and so it. it yeah. It you becomes... can't front. You can't side. You can't bounce, and you're behind. What's an Escanor player to do? Yeah, that that matchup feels very tough. And then, you won. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and then the spoilers with the finals were it was a very not competitive game ah. where man I've never felt so bad being on the winning <laughs> side before. Yeah. It got to this point where he was at you know, I was at level two, he was at level three, he was going for a double Ichika combo. And of course, you know, the course of the game, he triggered three choice triggers. And he while he was reaching his hand out to check my waiting room. I thought he was conceding until it was an awkward moment. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, yeah. That's rough. It, I mean, you're still going to Worlds, right? You know, true, in, true. in a situation like that, right? You're the Ichika player, right? Yeah. You're, you're still going to Worlds. But it's kind of like a few thousand dollars that you just kind of let slip through your grass. <laughs> It's like I could have put up a fight, but can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why Schwartz is is sometimes like that. It sucks, but, but in his defense, he almost survived me. You know, the onslaught deal, dealing lethal to finish him, <laughs> him. So he almost had a chance to go for it again. Nice Fair enough. Yeah, that deck is very resilient. I think that's what's that's what's a uh, very. You know, I'll also say this: uh, that deck has not had. Uh, nearly as good of a turnout since that event. I think it's had one top eight. Huh. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. yeah. Just it like... was really strong in Toronto. One, it was also an undefeated through Swiss deck and um, yeah, yeah, undefeated through Rosemont. And then you know, kind of, it still had some placements here and there, but yeah, not I think anywhere near I think it. Good. Yeah, I think the the people who are dedicated to playing it are are putting up good results with it, but uh, it's got a. It's got a smaller following. Yeah, yeah. No, there hasn't even been any uh, any uh, choices since uh, Rosemont. And oh, top yeah, eight. it was Door that got top eight. In uh, New York, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so there's the path. So if you want to win a regional, just do that. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, just don't lose. It's just very, don't lose. It's very simple. Very simple. Very easy, you know. Just uh, make good plays all the time, uh, have good luck all the time, and don't lose. Yeah. It's just that simple. <laughs> Ooh, then I want to parlay that into a mini New York report because I was also there. You are there. So, ha yeah, how did you, uh, how was your New York run? You know, I started, you know, I started really strong. I started 4-0 and I'm like, oh, damn, why am I winning? I just wanted to lose quickly and sleep in the rafters <laughs> <laughs> with the seats <laughs> are. So then I'm like, oh, man, there's a lot of people I know are doing really well and are further into this tournament. Like, you know, I feel like, you know, if we play, I'm going to just give them the win. <laughs> so they have a, you know, so I don't just straight crush people I know as hopes and dreams. <laughs> so, you know, so I was 4-0. Right. Round five, I played against a Gura deck. And he was, you know, he was getting very opportune cancels throughout the the whole game I actually it was one of the first games where I missed my Shizu combo and then at 2-3 I was what at 2-3 I was one card away from surviving a triple Gura finisher in which I apparently I could have won a shirt you could have so gotten I, the shirt if I knew ahead of time I would have tried that much harder <laughs> to survive <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I re I remember you walking up and it was like, oh, almost got the shirt, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then uh, the next round, I played against you know Jason and his you know, and his Overlord deck. So I was thinking, oh, I'm all right. 
a final play against somebody I know late enough in this tournament, so I'm pretty much gonna give him the win. But thankfully, he just straight took the victory without <laughs> any type of. Uh, There's no confusion at all. There's yeah, no any confusion. Type of confusion where you know apparently this is the theme of my you know the, my my losses for the day were once again I somehow whiffed the Shizu combos at level one with the Shizu and then he triple canceled me after the climax combo at level two yeah. and I didn't and then I'm like oh this game's over right here and there yeah yeah uh there's nothing that's more sure to put you in a bad game state than uh overlord comboing and then canceling you're like, well, that's insanely bad. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good is going to come from this. <laughs> Did you play it out after going X2? Oh, yeah. So I kept playing to try to boost, you know, people's tiebreakers. I didn't want to just be an anchor after that. Yeah. yeah. So then I was able to beat another ASCII Gura deck where they just had absolutely nothing going <laughs> on early and just ate everything mid. Yeah, I feel like that tends to happen. <laughs> we're going to talk about... And then let... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. So we're going to talk about the meta after this because I'm we very will. I'm very interested to get your take on some of these decks because we, you know, we know where we stand on a lot of this stuff, but um, love, oh, okay. to, love to get your perspective on some of the decks that are patrolling around the meta right now. Uh, so what were you about to say, Clinton? Oh, then the last round of Swiss play against a silica you know a silica alice deck yeah and which once again i managed to whiff my level one combo and somehow got rolled in this game yeah yeah are we just not drawing it is is that what's <laughs> is that what's happening <laughs> no this one was the funnier you know so i so, I like went through half my deck and I've seen four climaxes and all four of them were the mirror climax. Nice. <laughs> so literally I could not <laughs> There's draw. There's nothing to do. The, the Shizu combo, <laughs> the climax to save my life. Just can't, can't get there. Can't, can't do it. So at one point I had one in my stock, two in my hand and one in the waiting room with the mirror climax. Oh, yep. You hate to see it. Hate to see it. But yeah. There you go. Uh, lost the home field advantage. Tragic. Couldn't draw it. You know. Hate to see it, man. It's a rough one. Yeah, it was a uh, foreign territory. Yeah, yeah. And my uh, enthusiasm and motivation was low. True, true. The other foreign invaders, we got your back. We we, we got it done. <laughs> yeah, I appreciated it. Uh, or uh, uh, not we. Uh, I'll say, uh, what is it? Riaz, Ian, and Billy got it done. Yeah, <laughs> like. Imagine, imagine rocking up to the regional closest to you and three fucking Texans just roll in and you're like, we're taking the world's invites. Bye. <laughs> I, like, I can't believe Riaz got to play the series mirror three games in a row when it counts the most against people he's familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's just that world champion difference right there. <laughs> There's, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> so speaking about the world championship difference, let's hop, let's hop into our kind of meta discussion. We're going to kill Steve a little bit because we're going to talk about slime because obviously we have you on, Clinton. We're going to make Steve sad for a little bit as we talk about slime for a little while. What do you think about the the two wind, uh, <laughs> four wind finisher tech in uh, Riaz's ultimate list? Uh, after, you know, speaking with him, well, you know, a good bit you know i like his thinking behind it it has come into play it could replace itself with some card selection and then it has that extra effect where you could play another copy from hand for a one stock discount yeah and i guess it's you know sometimes you know you're just super lucky and trigger a wind in the mid to late game it's just gonna put in that extra work for sure and you know and burn two on attack is pretty solid yeah, yeah i I'm I'm consistently told that uh -huh. my finisher is not is mid. Yeah, yeah. And it's just better than this one. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can't, it can't be that. I mean, it, so I mean, uh, in in slime context, it's pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. What I'll say uh, about the win finisher is, I think the value of your finisher, and I uh, I told Riaz this too. 
uh, because he kind of asked me out of nowhere before showing me the deck. He said, do you think six packets can win? And I was like, yeah, but the rest of the deck has to support that. So I think the problem with Alice and the reason it isn't doing as well as it did in spring is the meta has kind of caught up to it from a perspective of players can get right on you faster than they could before. And more importantly, they don't have any way to transition the game. So as soon as Alice leaves the board and you don't have anything going on in the mid game, that everything you do kind of costs you resources. And so you just have to tread water as best you can until you think you're at a point where you can win. And Slime and Overlord um, are two really mid-game centric decks that have heavy mid-games that are difficult to handle. And so if they're able to drop the heavy mid-game and then slow the game down by blocking um, and by choking out your damage, then um, I think you you have a very hard time winning from those positions. So, um, I think the wind finisher, if it was in a different set, wouldn't, you wouldn't consider it. Like you just wouldn't, you have better choices, but it, yeah, I would, I consider, you know, I think it comps favorably or, you know, similar to playing Marine top end in hollow live. Yeah. Where, you know, there's plenty of times I can't, you know, I can't kill people at three zero with three of them on the board, but you know, but the fact that it's so easy to get them out and that they're so cheap to utilize that, you know, it's worth that slight, you know, that inconsistency of not dealing seven. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I did try out the, the wind finisher for a few weeks, uh, after getting back from New York and I, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm just gonna pull the the voice clip and like put it in right here. It's, I'm just gonna say uh, I have no strong feelings about this one way or the other <laughs> uh, Just because like uh, it does have that consistency of like, you know if you're playing the game right and We're you know, we're having anywhere close to like an okay game you'll have triple win finisher uh and sometimes i'll just win but whenever you have like more scuffered games you know scuffered games means less stock you need eight stock to do triple win if you don't have eight stock then you have double win if you don't if you only have double win that's two burn twos and two swings and another guy and if you're having a scuffed game that probably means your opponent is ahead if your opponent is ahead they're probably ahead in damage and now we don't exactly have enough reach to try to kill somebody with the money and the resources we have and that's not necessarily a bad thing like yeah, I mean, you but, still see the hedge, right? The yeah. Benny Maru's still there to heal yeah. yourself and, like, try to see if there's a way you can reach for a little more than what you have. Um, but uh, I think that, yeah, the allure of it is the self-setting. You know? Uh, but yeah, you got a safe floor. You sacrifice, you know, the, the less consistent, you know, higher ceiling from the Benny Maru for that. Yeah. Well, he's also playing Benny Maru. Over Maru's, time, I think, yeah. you know, it just evens out in a big enough sample size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, I think self-setting combos are, are really valuable in big tournaments because in an 11 round event, you're going to see every type of variance your deck can produce. And when you're, uh, I think this is the main reason why, let's say, Alice Silica has done better historically than Alice Kirito, is because checking X for your opponent's guys is going to yield every tool that you need to, to get to the end of the game. It's going to yield more finishers, it's going to yield more climaxes, it's going to yield more Demonic Sword Grams, whatever it is that you need to, like, try and push for the win. And, you know, the, the cost of that is obviously healing. Um, so if the game gets um, out of hand on you, then you, you, you're you kind of backed into a corner with very few places to go. But what you're trading is like a consistency that's going to last through an entire event. Um, at Chicago, I, I don't think I ever failed to... I, I think I double silicate at minimum every game. 
and it's just there are very few ways for it to go wrong when you're when you're just you're drawing that you're checking that many cards yeah uh for me personally i'm gonna be playing the eight pants archetype just because um i've had more time on it and i don't think it's like like at best i think playing the wind is a side grade and houston's in three week, two two three weeks you know uh i've already got like two months on the other list we'll just keep going on that uh Although I will say, uh, I started playing the the Dragonoid Bonder for my one of Dragonoid, dude. That oh, it's so good to check just for the tap check. So good. I I underestimated it so hard. I was like, I mean, I was already gonna swing with the Benny Mars first anyway, right? Like, does it really matter if I know the burns that are about to happen? It matters. It it's so sick. And I'm always moving the climax to the second card because yeah. there's always the climaxes on top when yeah. I play that card. Yeah. I'm like, this is why I justify playing this card. Nah, dude, it's it's sick. I'm on I'm on your side. Uh, uh, that also making I didn't know how much it would matter, but having the bonder does make double Benny Maru Milam a seven stock play as opposed to an eight stock play and man yeah that matters a lot oh yeah that's huge dude it's massive yeah. it was sick uh i think seven yeah. stock is kind of the magic number for things you can get off every game mm -hmm. like seven stock at the end game is really achievable anything more than that eight is like the hard barrier nine is like near impossible anything more than that is fully impossible so but if you have nine stock against your opponent you're probably already like way ahead or you're playing tokyo revengers sure or yeah you have some kind of artificial <laughs> yeah mechanism for it but yeah yeah that's like a 17 stock play so like you you need yeah you, you kind of need that <laughs> um let's talk about the meta for a second um so we're gonna get a bushiroad announcement on the 19th which is gonna be after the recording of this podcast if it's anything super special obviously um we'll 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 break it down for the well, for the audience we will all right all right so right here e, ben from the future here as it turns out the presentation came and went and uh i'm the only one talking here <laughs> uh i'm sure we're going to have great delights over everybody losing their money from dengeki bunko and steve will love to talk about a, another level two combo uh, for advantage but um uh, no ban list and so not much else we really feel like talking about here. We'll see you guys after Houston. You know, I'm going to I'm going to tape my reactions right now. Oh my god, I can't believe they didn't ban Alice. Hi, uh, life's so hard for a slime player. It's so annoying. I can't believe they didn't ban anything really. And uh, oh wow, the the new English exclusive. It's so cool. So great. And then uh, after this, you guys will all hear our reaction to it because we're gonna tape it after it happens and slot it right in here. Uh, Clinton, do you have any reactions for the for for the announcement that just happened? I hope you know. Right now, the meta game is so you know the main dominant decks are like you know are pretty cl are pretty close with each other in power level that you know you really can't hit any of them or just throws everything off unless you you know and i don't give bushiro the credit of preemptively hitting cards because you're hitting these cards to try to balance this out and that cause a crazy cascade effect so i'm hoping for the first time ever that it's just a bunch of unrestrictions of sets that doesn't deserve to be restricted and that'll be it and then save you know future hits after you know this season oh okay hold up hold up that was your prediction but right now i want you just give me your like give me your reaction after it to what i think the theoretical yeah, yeah. whatever the whatever the announcement's gonna be react to it right now like i can't believe kurumi is still at two this card could oh, be at man. six and it still does not it's crazy right that's <laughs> this card could be at six. <laughs> Steve, what's your reaction? Having I, just heard this announcement, you know, what what do we think? 
Thank God Bushiroad finally came in and put an end to the toxic meta by banning not only Shuna, but Murin and disqualifying all the people that won with slime. <laughs> hey, wow. It's just, it's what needed to be done. Players might argue it's unjust, but in reality, this is the only outcome that makes sense in the face of this extreme imbalance and there you have it listeners that was our reactions to it um <laughs> to be like wow i can't believe uh, alice 2 went to six oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um talking about the the bad list idea a little bit there was an interview with matt intern coon social media manager from bushy road on Weiss and Chill's YouTube channel. Go check it out in the description below. It's about an hour long interview. They do discuss a lot of interesting topics of like kind of how Matt's been working there for nearly a decade. I think actually just a decade and um, why they structure the, what is it? Why they structure the announcements in English the way that they do uh, as opposed to kind of the more stakeholder focused ones in JP and uh, uh most relevant to us right now uh how they approach the ban list um and so he did go out of his way to say that they're trying not to copy jp specifically and there are outliers like ima but like uh he was very frank when weiss and chill was like yeah i mean people were asking about an alice ban and what are your thoughts on it and matt was like i don't know bro it's not winning like <laughs> well we'll we'll tender our judgment until until later times and we see more results from this season but like you know they're they're trying to have a less heavy hand in general i think they paraphrase. learned from last season yeah, yeah. where where they hit, you know, Kaguya, even though it w didn't do any type of winning, which was one of the biggest head scratchers. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, like, hitting some of the hits, I think both JP and English have had good hits and bad hits. Um, I think the Kaguya hit is the most salient example of why did you even bother? Like, it, it didn't do anything except convert decently. It wasn't like it was just smashing people. So, yeah, that one was strange and felt like kind of a pseudo copy of JP where they were like, there was just different outcomes. But I think also um, they've had good hits. So, um, you know, what you said earlier about the ban list is really important. Like, you can't go after one of these decks to the exclusion of the others because you're just going to see the meta warp around that that move. So, like, we joked about it, but hypothetically, you know, let's say they came in and did something to Slime, right? Um, all that does is all the decks that were weak against Slime, now they all get a boost. And so you saw in the spring, Alice was just hard stomping literally every event. It was like the entire top four. It was winning absolutely everything. It won both Rumbles or all three Rumbles. So, like, it's clear that that deck absent some of its more troublesome matchups will return to that level of dominance. And so you have to, I think if you're Bushiroad, you have to be very careful about it. But at the same time, you have four decks that are crowding the meta so badly that it's hard for even like very strong decks to enter. So like, it's kind of a sad day when we look at Eight Door Itsuki or Escanor or any of these decks that are lurking in this just below this very top tier, and we're like, man, those decks are never gonna win because they're missing like even even Avatar, like a deck with a extremely potent end game and like very reasonable tools throughout the game, is not good enough. And so hey, it was good enough for Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you'll see that, right? You'll see like one-offs where like very dedicated players who've been playing the deck for a very long time, you know, they'll crack into the top eight or in the top three um, with specific decks. You'll see like one Bang Dream deck, one Atla deck, one SDS deck. But in terms of like consistent winning and conversion, these decks are just like, they're just a tier below. And a lot of it, um, and I'm anxious to get your thoughts on this, Clinton, but I think a lot of this has to do with, like, the power that's required to contest 
in the current at the top of the meta. Do you mean like board presence? Yeah, and yeah, board yeah, presence yeah. Power, yeah. Yeah, like right now, you know, we just switched to this level two meta in the middle game that is completely like stagnating everything and it's making mirrors that, you know, you either, it turns into either a Mexican standoff or you're into a mess of side attacking or crashing. And you have to pick and choose once you're right opportunity to do either. Yeah, for me personally, um, because uh, so you need you need at least 11K probably to contest Alice and 14K or 13.5 to contest Miron. And those are massive numbers. Um, even, you know, even from level threes, you know, like level three early plays that people were hanging their hats on last season, like like Sora. Sora doesn't get to 13.5 ever. And so it, it's one of those things without another boost. And so I think the problem is, is that when you leave open lanes, especially against like Alice is the worst example of this, where your opponent Alice combos, you have you have no way to answer it. So you have you have to run it in because you can't you can't start side attacking at that point. The game is too early. Um, so you run it in. But like if you trigger or your deck starts to wobble and then now you have all these open lanes and they're landing threes on you. I mean, the game ends before it ever gets started. And so I think the variance that comes off of hitting like hitting threes in the in the early to mid game um, is problematic for the game. I think it I think it weakens skill expression and I think uh, it makes it hard hard to win in some setups. Yeah, Clinton, now that you've already won uh, with your level, your very strong level two, uh, what are your opinions on, I guess, just powerful level twos? Not even just Alice, just like Alice, Muron. Let's say, like, in future sets, even in like Guilty Gear coming up, screw it. What if, if they printed more powerful level twos that, like, just hit the board and get value? Do you think that's, like, do you think that would be a good direction for the game, or do you think that would continue to stagnate it? It's so it's so it's so weird because a it'll be nice if it had it because that means right out of the bat it could be competitive with you know the current meta as it is, and then you know the downside is just gonna keep perpetuating where it stands now. Mm -hmm. But it also depends on you know what it does and what's the support for it because you know we went from a complete shift for level twos for a super after dot where nobody played them you know except for niche backups then it switched to we're only playing them because they're standby targets and we really don't even want to play them from our hands anymore either to now you know we could either play them straight up or cheat them into play just from brainstorming yeah i think they've there has been a, a limit <clears throat> there's been a very limited amount of level two value engines that have been printed prior to this um and only... most of them were like <clears throat> sorry most of them were kind of like the the early play. They're actually just a level one combo, but different. Right? Yeah, yeah, like Joker mm. or the Shion from Hollow Live One, mm -hmm. where it's like uh, uh, the uh, Clap of Thunder combo. From yeah, Tennessee, yeah, or, but... or, or SDS has got one too, where it's like you yeah, just huh? draw a bunch of cards. Like it's like check four, add all of them. Slime even has one of those in set two. It's just like yeah, it exists. They weren't like level twos. They were like level ones. Right. But I think another thing that's that's problematic about these is that level two slayers right so level two slayers were printed kind of to respond to some of this stuff but their value comes at one so like people were responding to alice by playing level two slayers they'd be like okay put down this level two slayers like 12k or whatever beats level twos level two slayers don't do anything to Miran really and anti-early which was the other thing that was printed to kind of respond to these kind of power games because it used to be, you know, your level threes were coming down at two and those were kind of like the pseudo value engines at two. Um, you'd have these like one ones or like I can anti early you to somewhere. And it's like that doesn't do anything to Miran either. So level two value engines that produce like extreme resources are kind of in a weird spot where they're hard to interact with. And then you, when you throw a hexproof on top of that, it, it becomes even harder to interact with it. 
Yeah. And they got so much value from just doing the Campbell, you having to expend a card in hopes of even just trading with it. And they could, you know, most of the time they could just play a single backup to get over it. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so I, I guess in a way of like, if they had printed, you know, if they had printed every set from the beginning of time with <clears throat> level two value engines and ways to deal with them, right? You know, like, sure, whatever, but most sets just don't just can't like what are you gonna do i think i think the other thing that drives this is um the the way that weiss has become uh as it's gotten more mature there there have been older sets that tried to use level two value engines but the the biggest difference was there wasn't as big of a power gap so like they weren't reaching these fantastic power numbers 11k 12k 13k with very little like effort um and even more than that you didn't have good ways to set them up so part of what makes alice and buron so strong is not just they're good but they're also they have tons of easy setups you know alice a, a skilled alice player is going to get double triple alice like 95 percent of the time yeah. and like five percent of the time deck's going to explode fantastically but Muron's even more consistent than that where it's like I have a guy that says discard a card get it and I have a combo it's like if I reveal half of the cards of my deck I can just get it so like the setup for it is even stronger than it's ever been in terms of like consistency because there was a 2-1 value engine for Kirito in the in the Alicization deck it was like on reverse stock two from the waiting room and then check four and then add a character which is like extreme value but there was a ton of caveats you needed a guy in memory you needed a reverse and the climax was a stock soul and so muron is better than that card in every feasible way it has a better trigger it's got a better setup and it's got more power so like the adaptation is just those cards are just ramping in value Mm-hmm. So yeah, and I always hated the concept of printing silver bullets because either a, they're not useful when they're needed, and b, most of the time, you know, it's just like, why did we even have this problem to begin with? You know, making these things, you know, it's either gonna work great or they do nothing. Right. And so I guess the the real question is, do they continue like? ramping the game like this does all of the older decks just get cut out as they print more sets with good engines that can now contest with the newly established like two engines in their own way and contest in some way do we think they'll just keep pushing that or do we think the bad hammer comes right before right before or after worlds I I would like to see uh Clinton, I'd like your thoughts on this, but I would like to see a restrict before worlds. Um after after the season, the fall season. Mm. So I want all the regionals to be done with. I don't think it's fair to the competitive players to have to adjust to a new meta midway through. So I hope when the, the announcement comes out this week there's nothing. Um mm -hmm. but I, I would like to see a pre worlds restrict um to try and stimulate the meta a little bit what do you think clinton because you know i compare to you know the precedent the weird precedent they sent last year where two weeks into the fall season they hit mashoku for some reason <laughs> yeah. even though it was already phased out by the nino deck yeah and, and then like three more weeks and they had another adjustment to it and then the week before war you know and then another final adding two more tacking on a restriction to uh the quince deck right before worlds too yeah you know so personally i wouldn't i would not be against it but you know but that's only assuming that it's carefully crafted which you know right now i don't have the most confidence in all right you're you're in ultimate control at bushi road you're about to do a ban adjustment what's the adjustment and let's say it's before worlds. before worlds let's After say it's like a month before Worlds. Yeah. like literally like christmas comes the new year comes 
Here's your uh, New Year's present. It's a ban list. What do you think's on it? Man, if there was something, you know, if I would do, I guess it would be like a heavy, I wouldn't say heavy handed, but it would just affect multiple series. Cause you know, you can't just do one or two and just think that's good enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would almost do like the Yu-Gi-Oh slash magic strategy where you're just hitting, you know, the, the top thing and then hitting the next, what I think will take its place right afterwards to try to make sure there's no, you know, a vacuum in power. Right. All so right. So the top four sets, we're hitting those. Right. All right. So what are we hitting? So the slime SAO uh, overlord slash Nazarick and I get and the Gura deck. Right. Yeah, so like you... the ideal scenario, it, this is gonna sound funny. You hit them to the point where the where you know Quint's decks are now competitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I get I get what you mean. So if you're restricting slime, how do you how do you reel that deck without making it Neutering useless? It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my philosophy is always you hit the a utility. You know, you put a restriction on like. A great utility card and then you just put two other if you have to put two primarily something that's very easy uh finish or something that's uh easy to play that helps the goal of the deck mm -hmm. so in slime case you know you start off with every you start off with every one you know you're telling people that this is gonna matter you start off with the stack swap being on the board okay yep that's a that's the highest value utility card they have. Yeah, so you want to put that. You know, I always I hate the idea of putting climax combos on there because you're just you know killing two cards plus. Right. So I'm not gonna do that. So instead, I would put like another utility zero that's really good. Okay, a utility zero. Which one would yeah, you pick? Yeah, another utility zero. I'm not sure off the top of my head what it will be now because there's, you know, slime zeros are so strong. It has such a huge catalog of useful cards that it could almost immediately be replaced with something almost equal or just only slightly worse. Do you think uh, taking out the 2-1 Shuna from just like basically the package, is that too much? Does that kill the deck? I don't think it kills the deck, but I just don't think it, it would accomplish what they're trying to do. Okay. See, that's interesting. You know, I have sometimes the... you could just win games without those cards straight up on the board anyway. Yeah. See, I have a, I have a, I have a differing opinion on that. I believe that <laughs> the two one Shuna is the the main reason why uh, decks lose to slime, because much like Armin before, when you remove all interactivity from the game then a whole lot of cards become dead in your deck and dead in your hand because they don't you can't interact so at the top of the meta right now you have two tap counters a money counter all being played by the best decks and they literally are dead in hand or and the plus six souls counter dead in hand because all your guys have hexproof and so i, I think i think removing shuna from the equation at least opens up the window for counterplay it may not hurt the consistency of the deck very much but i think i think weiss it's essential to weiss that you be able to respond to your opponent with cards from your deck and global hexproof is a bad design that makes both players feel bad it makes you feel bad because you didn't actually like do anything skillful you put a guy down and now your opponent can't do anything makes your opponent feel bad because he put cards in his deck that are meant to handle situations that are difficult when your opponent's attacking and now he can't play them so yeah i, I that that's my my thoughts on on shuna at least i, I think you're a spot on with the stock swap mm -hmm. where when you go after value engines like that or, or like valuable like tools that don't really have a replacement and you force players to choose between them, they have to de decide on what's going to provide the greatest value. I think the Shuna 0, <laughs> zero is another good candidate because the source of like raw plussing and power at zero, and um, and there's not really a great replacement for it. It would just be filled in by like beaters and better hand fixes. 
I think, you know, personally, I always hated the introduction of the defensive counter that does something more other than presides, you know, provide pure power. Interesting. Because I felt like that one of the things that created, you know, that that started the early, you know, imbalance between sets. How so? Like, I remember back, you know, like back then, you know, like where like only one deck had money counter, like, oh, that's huge. Now we finally have to, you know, play around, you know, a, you know, the only series or two that have something that completely make my turn. One of my characters basically do nothing, yeah. you know, at a critical stage of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it turned into one of the things where later on it was like an arms race between sets that had them compared to the sets that didn't have them. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a great point to bring up is that because Weiss doesn't have crossplay of any kind, when a set gets a tool that nobody else has, then the meta chain warps around that tool. If it's, and I feel if like it's that's powerful. one of the reasons why we even got hexproof effects in the first place because you know now those were a silver bullet to that. Right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not against hexproof as an idea. I like it fine when it's attached to a level three, like this guy has hexproof that's a feature of the card um so like if you like if you have a guy it's like hexproof bodyguard it's like okay I i'm totally fine with that like hexproof as an idea isn't inherently toxic i think yeah. that just when you know the most extreme example at the arm in where yes. you know where itself it's hexproof and give up to two other characters hexproof was pretty ridiculous on top of meaningful power yeah, yeah. exactly and so you, I think you have to be careful with cards that provide hexproof because that's a, a route for exploit. Yeah, at least this one, you know, it, it's a two card board commitment and it's itself, it's vulnerable unless you set up a really funky double, you know, a three committed slot board. Right. Yeah. And then the second card, I would hit another utility great card. I think almost every deck would play is the, the Benny Maru level three, which is probably too powerful as a non-combo splash of, you know pseudo splashable there is a restriction on its effect but its only condition is you're playing the three best colors this series has yeah 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 um and you have uh pretty strong control over your uh, level up situation because of uh you have ways to put cards into the clock of your choosing um so like the 1 -0 facilitates that pretty well um so yeah, I, I don't think that's a real condition. It's it's just a... It's it just... forces you to then consider playing a different actual healer, playing a finisher that heals, playing around the other two uh, off finishers that either have a lot of reach, but you could only do two, and you have to have, like, E full hand, or you get the clock kick, which is super expensive, and you don't get a lot of reach. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, Riaz is happy in those scenarios because like he gets to just jam the the set one finisher <laughs> and call it good. Sure, but, sure. He, he still has to replace two cards. True. Yeah, yeah, exactly. True. Uh, but I, yeah, I think that's a great point. Non combo finishers that have a bunch of like output and healing and uh, you know they just kind of operate in isolation. Yeah, there that's that's probably not a great probably not a great thing. If, All right. Yeah. So for Simon, probably put you know, stock swap, mm -hmm. Benny Maru, mm -hmm. and I don't know some fringe playable level two that you know, like around fifty of the decks would play, <laughs> like the Ricky Shuna. Sure. Sure. All right. Uh, I was about to say we could go down like the whole line of every single band that we would potentially do. Uh, but it has been uh, about an hour and 20 minutes now. <laughs> and uh, I have work tomorrow. Steve has work, work tomorrow. Clinton, I I think you have work tomorrow. Ooh, but let me add, just add one more thing in. For SAO, I think with the way English is currently at with that deck, where, you know, Asuna is not a great early out at all for that deck. Yeah. And that the only thing I will hit from that is one of its one one backups interesting okay. see yeah we were talking about it because i've i've played the deck a lot and it feels like obviously the most toxic part of the deck is how much speed it generates for nothing um like zero expenditure of resources to get free deck speed 
Um, and so I, I felt like if you separated Asuna Zero from the Floating Castle Ankrad event or Administrator from those two pieces, it's probably enough to like bring it back enough to where it can it can't reliably get to those states as quickly um but if you remove the promo backup i don't know that that changes very much outside of now you just auto lose to slime instead of probably lose to slime <laughs> <laughs> hey as you know slimes hit too uh yeah yeah but it's interesting uh yeah this is this is the slime hit world as well yeah yeah it's Pretty interesting sure. to think about because i i feel that i feel that deck speed is the main thrust of why that deck is overpowered um i what they did to it in jp feels extremely excessive but yes yes uh like if you you can't do that and i think if you go after leafa um you also hurt the deck in a in a in a fundamental way that it probably can't recover from easily. So whatever you put in a choice restrict with Leafa, they'll have to choose Leafa every time. The card is is too important to every game plan that comes out of that set. I think SAO also has to be treated with a sort of lighter touch because you don't have the you don't have the manga set. So a lot of the overpowered cards from that set we don't have and so um i think sao's build is very fragile and not not a lot can be pulled out of it without breaking it and what's unfortunate about that is what's left in the set isn't very good after after that so behind alice and silica and kirito is not a lot you know a very mediocre minus souls um and some other mediocre finishing and and level one combos but like nothing even remotely competitive will come out of it if if you manage to damage the the alice engine in a way where those finishers don't work yeah so that's why my strategy is to you know we let's not attack the the engine or the milling because although it's a lot of milling sometimes you know the deck's weakness is that it still has prone to spot you know periods of quote unquote bad luck right yeah sure yeah and then you know like a restriction you know where you're hitting their you know make them play other absurd backups if they even want to waste their slots on those and take out the one ones it now gives those wacky level two killer cards such you know a fighting chance and then it makes it where you know it's it's a great board at one if they get it out but it's still you know now there's a chance we could get over this instead of zero chance right yeah right. that makes sense there it is all right well it would have been nice to touch on Hollow Live and Overlord. We've talked a good deal about slime, and yeah. I, that feels appropriate for the guests we have today. Last thing today, um, Steve, do you hear that? Oh yeah, it's very faint, but I can definitely hear something. Uh huh. Clinton, can you hear that? No, not really. Uh, uh but now it's it's coming in now. It's oh okay, okay. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, it's a whale sighting. Uh, we've got a whale on the show today, actually. Uh, just in our midst. Clinton. Yeah, we hooked a live one. Uh-huh. I hear you're looking for Benny Marus. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I got one, need two more. Uh -huh. But, you know, but now that it's... I, you know, so far, the really funny, I always joke that right now, the sell, you know, the buyer market for this cart is me and Gustavo. <laughs> and we're in cahoots. <laughs> so we're not overpaying for this cart. <laughs> The, we've always see that's True. the thing that's well known about whales is that they move in packs right and they're, right right they're collaborative yeah, these pods. yeah and and they don't work against each other it's all it's collective as a collaborative whale clinton how, how's that search going what do you think the price point is for for you and gus here i think at the beginning of the season i i said it was 800 bucks some people told me oh, no that's kind of low and then I'm like, come on, let's think about this, guys. First of all, this card is definitely not a female. If this was the Shuna, this card would be really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> like two, you know, 
Yeah. He's one of the more fringe, you know, you look at Popular, he's lower on the tier in a series that, you know, yeah. that it's not, not Rimuru, everybody right? loves. Yeah, it's yeah. not super main, that mainstream. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to value this at like 800 early. Yeah. And then now I think I keep dropping my price point because <laughs> of, man, do I really want this? <sighs> you know, in my theoretical ban list, this card's hit. <laughs> <laughs> the risk of theoretical bandless <laughs> <laughs> and so it goes uh well good luck um uh, are there any other sets that you've actually maxed uh so many right now recently <laughs> since i finally got all these uh kurumi one one promos <laughs> i finally updated my data like that. oh nice man so, i see yeah. i got one sitting on my desk if only i had known yeah if only you had known man. yeah if i could have tossed a, a small fish to a huge like, whale. i didn't know that it was costa rica vibe <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, this is the Costa Rica man. meta. Uh, meta and I think champion. it was set one data line. Yeah. <laughs> so True. props to that guy. That guy needs a sponsored invite. Yeah, that guy really needs it. Yeah. yeah. He 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 was gaming for sure for sure. Um. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate too because the the judge promo is also a dude. <laughs> hey. At least it's foil. There, there's a girl judge promo. Top exists. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on. Non foil. Yeah. Oh, oh it's I, not foil? It's oh, not I didn't foil. Know that. No. Oh, okay, okay. The okay. foil is Iro. Got it. Got it. Yeah, got so it. the how the judge tier promos, because I'm actually a registered judge too. Uh huh. You get the first tier, so this one will be the um, the top. She's uh, That one is not foil with a stamp. And then the other one, where you actually have to judge events and redeem points for, that one's foil. And there it is. Nice. Well, so if you're trying to get uh, Max Rarity uh, standby avatar. I saw somebody listing them for $1,000, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, Yeesh. to buy your uncle's love, <laughs> it's going to cost some money. <laughs> and so it See, goes. that's why you coordinate with other people who might or might not <laughs> <this card. laughs> Unionize the buyers in the face of the sellers. <laughs> Bring the price down. <laughs> like to me, that's a three, three to four hundred dollar card at max. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's not meta. It's not, and it's a dude. Yeah, and, and it's, it's dude. two days of work. Yeah, for it's a two judge. days of work for the judge. See, yeah. that makes it worth more for me if I'm the uh, judge. I'm like, nah, nah, son. I had to work two days for this thing. <laughs> I'm cashing in. Oh man. All right. Well, uh, if I happen to win a regional, Clinton, I'll sell you my Benny Meyer. <laughs> nice. He sold out his local. You know my theoretical nice. price range for it. Oh, I mean, I mean, like you know, oh, true. I'll Gus, Gus, Gus also so wants it. Me and him could split it. But uh, I, yeah. Oh, dang. That's rough. Nope. It's already on the podcast. Nope, it's already on the you pod. Can't back out now. <laughs> Sorry, Gus. You got played. We have the guest on. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. Well, Clinton, thanks for stopping by. Is there anything that you would like to say at all? Like, thank you guys for having me. Yeah. And also, yes, old guy still rules in this game. <laughs> and there it is. That's the right. old The old folks still got it. So, that's our show for today. So, tune in next time after your next deck out. And don't you forget to take the refresh point.